David, on August 8th, Elon tweeted, Tesla's going to build the robo-taxi. In your opinion, how will the market react? I think, it, look, it, Tesla stock's down, what, more than 50% this year. So the market's not putting a ton of stock in this yet. I think there's a wait-and-see attitude on this. You know, there's the idea that when things start going south, Elon always has another uh, another way to keep the narrative going. And I'm, I, look, they, they clearly have technology, autopilot and then FSD, but we'll see. I mean, it's hard to bet against them when it comes to technology because all, all of the Elon antics and drama aside, the company has been, they have great technology and EVs. There are some autonomous stuff. The, the driver assist technology is pretty good. It's just the marketing and regulatory side of it's been a mess for them, but, but they have good stuff. So will they come out with, this robo taxi in August, you know, the market's certainly going to wait and see, and so would I, because it's, it, you know, we, we haven't seen them showing it off. And, um, you know, Elon's always late with everything. So <laughs> if he does get there at all, you know, where's the roadster? So we'll, we'll, we'll see. I wish I had a firm answer, but it's Elon. It, it is Elon. Institutional investors, and Bloomberg's done a great job covering this. They want the Model 2. They, they clearly want the Model 2. They want a growth story, and it's not clear that autonomy is for anybody. And that it's a, I mean, there, there's so many questions about autonomy, particularly on the, the passenger vehicle side of it. You look how, how slowly Waymo is deploying and growing this thing. And, and they've got to have the best technology out there. They certainly have the longest time of development and data gathering on this thing and they're they're very deliberate in how they roll it out and if they are then tesla's going to have to be so where's investors want to see revenue growth profitable revenue growth you will get that with a model two you will get that with good volumes on a cyber truck which we don't have right now that's what they want out of tesla they want to see vehicle growth because they're realizing tesla's a car company what if this is this is a big what if? What if Tesla introduced two versions of the Robo Taxi, one with the steering wheel and pedals, one without, and it was that aha moment? You have the the Model Two, but you also have the Robo Taxi at the same time. Very possible. I don't know why they wouldn't. I mean, if they have this vehicle done, they, well, the reason they wouldn't is they realize the Model Two is too expensive to sell at any kind of price, so they just turned it into a batch built Robo Taxi. Now that that assumes a lot about their ability to to build even robo-taxi volumes and not have it be a complete money loser. But the Reuters story about the Model 2 being canceled or delayed is, I think there's something there, certainly. And we'll, we'll see what they come up with. I think investors do want the Model 2, though. That, that, that's where, that, that's been Elon's dream all along. And it, it also determines whether or not he can compete in all segments with BYD and the other Chinese EV makers. Without something like a Model 2 and in that price range, boy, it's pretty tough to compete with them because they're selling some really cheap EVs. When did the BYD vehicles come to America by leveraging the NAFTA loophole? I'm not sure Biden or Trump would allow that to happen. And, you know, and, and look, there's, there are people in Congress now saying that they would Josh Hawley, didn't he float the idea of a 100% tariff on Chinese vehicles made in, in Mexico? Mm -hmm. that, that's tough because there, there's a will in both parties to make sure that the U.S. auto industry and our European and Japanese and Korean friends don't get eaten up by the Chinese auto industry, particularly with electric vehicles. You know, what, I'll, I'll tell you what, and this is, this is David just thinking aloud. When... When I started seeing all that's going on with TikTok and that we might mandate that they sell the company to be able to operate in the U.S., to me, that's very interesting because in order for U.S. car companies to really any foreign car company to do business in China originally, you had to have a 50-50 JV in which you gave your Chinese partner half the profits and access to your IP, right? So if, if this thing with TikTok is maybe a roadmap for how we're going to handle that, the Chinese do have a cost advantage and a battery advantage in, in, in some ways against Tesla, against certainly the established car makers. So if they want to do business here, do we force them into some sort of JV? I mean, it's just an idea because they did it to us, but 
you know, what's going on with TikTok to me could be, you know, at least directionally where the U.S. government wants to go with Chinese bringing their technology into the U.S. Let's throw some politics into the mix here. Speaker Johnson's going to bring the the Ukraine bill and the the Israel bill to the floor and buried in there is banning TikTok. The Senate's going to be forced to, to take that bill up. There is some movement. If there is some movement from a legislative perspective on TikTok, does China retaliate in some way? Look, that, that, that's that's the tightrope on which we walk. <laughs> yeah, I think they could. That, the opposite side of it is what I just said, though, is, you know, the Chinese have made American companies join up with their companies, not just in the auto industry, but others as well, to do business over there. And we've let them buy whatever they wanted for the longest time in the U.S. and do whatever they wanted over here. And so now... America has finally decided that it, you know, the, the training wheels can come off for the Chinese companies, industries, and economy, and maybe we need to put it on ours in areas where they've they've used years of of trade, let's call it trade deal largesse from us, and and to a degree the Europeans, to force some restrictions on on Chinese companies, and you know look at the European market, look at the South American market, look at Mexico. You have a lot of EVs pouring in there. You know, I've, I've talked to some people at the uh, Korean battery makers, and they worry about Chinese batteries being dumped here. They won't get the tax breaks, but they don't need it because their costs are so much lower because they've got established supply chains and minerals and all of that in China. So the Biden administration is clearly interested in protecting U.S. interests here, and, and I think Trump would as well. Like if J- Josh Hawley is sort of at this point a, a proxy for what Trump would do. And... Um, and he's pretty, he's pretty MAGA, right? I mean, you, you know that side of the world better than I do in terms of the politics. But I think if Hawley's pushing that, then he probably has talked to Trump about it. But, it, it, you know, that, that's where Trump would be. So neither president is going to allow this to happen. What, what happens on the autonomy side? So China's obviously leading on electric vehicles because they control the supply chain. They're developing AI. They're developing chips. They're developing autonomous driving. What's going to happen when they try and export that to america is does that raise an, a, another flag it seems like they're trying china's trying to take over the entire automotive supply chain from a software perspective and, and a hardware perspective yeah you know, i i think with autonomy we've got already pretty clear policies i mean look, look at what too simple just went through i mean it basically destroyed too simple right plus their own kind of silliness behind the scenes and trying to deal with the CFIUS restrictions that they had but you know they got CFIUS approval and then they were investigated again and then their founders and executives who left started tried a new startup and taking some of the IP and company is you know being sold for very small amounts of money if it ever gets sold you know I I think that's another another blueprint for for how we'll handle Chinese companies trying to bring their AI over here look if you can't get TikTok here you're not going to get an autonomous vehicle company gathering data in the U.S. I mean, that's mapping data. That's that's pretty sensitive. Not, not that they couldn't get that, but letting their cars drive around here, uh, that's tough for me to see as well. I, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this where we have, there's still a lot of trade going on between the U.S. and China. But then, you know, in, in other areas, particularly with technology, we're kind of in like all, just about like active trade war on these things. So it's... It's complicated, but I think at the end of the day, we're not going to let them take over the EV market in the U.S., and we're not going to let them have their way with with autonomous technology and AI in the U.S. When does autonomy and autonomous vehicles become a national security issue? It is. Do you mean when does the government recognize that? Yes. Probably when we make more headway in, in actually using them. I mean, look, the military is already using drones, they're already using self-driven vehicles to go into hot zones, that sort of thing. So the military, I think, is already, probably the NSA are paying a lot of close attention to autonomy. When does the federal government more publicly start to act on on this stuff? I, I think it's when you start to... I, look, you and I have been waiting forever for the government to come up with a, a more standard set of rules for autonomous vehicles. And, you know, it, it's it's still kind of a state-by-state state thing. And, you know, the, the, the government, I think, still sees autonomy as just this, you know, series of test fleets around the U.S., whether it be in trucking or robotaxis, and, and mostly in the Sunbelt states. So it's not really 
something that they see as, you know, that they need to deal with in a pressing way. And that's just the way the government works. They always wait till technology becomes a problem before they start to, <laughs> to deal with the, with the issue. But autonomy is becoming a business. I'm going to read a, a, a tweet here from, from Elon on, on X. If you call it X or tweet, I don't know what the term is now. But he, Elon tweeted the following on April 16th. Not quite betting the company, but going balls to the wall for autonomy is a blindingly obvious move. Everything else is like variations of a horse carriage. Then you have the, the co-CEO of Waymo's out there saying LA is going to be a $2 billion market. Tesla signaling to the market, Waymo signaling to the market that this is a big business. But yet investors aren't paying attention. Government's not really paying attention. Is this just a classic case of investors not understanding the sector and waiting to actually see meaningful results after being burnt from the SPAC craze, which we saw a lot of the autonomy <clears throat> companies go belly up? Yeah, well, they, 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 we, we've seen the whole thing winnowed down to, what, handful of players in – actually, you and I sort of predicted this. There are more players in the trucking – Freight sphere of autonomy. I mean, RoboTaxi, what do you have left? There's May Mobility, Cruise, Waymo. May and Waymo are, are moving at a slow pace. Cruise has totally rebooted itself and is just getting back into, not, I wouldn't say service, but we could just getting back into running vehicles. And um, you have you know, a handful of trucking guys doing some pretty interesting stuff. So, what it kind of comes down to is we have a few operating systems in each sphere, the commercial freight area, moving people around town area. I look, Zooks is still there too. We just don't know where it is and what they're doing. Um, so theoretically for uh, robo taxi sort, sorts of businesses out there. And then you have whatever Brian Seleski is starting up, but that's on the trucking side too. That's the former Argo guy. So yeah, look, it's come down to a handful of players and, and all really in some stage of experimentation. I mean, you do have like Gaddick, they're, they're bringing revenue in. Waymo is. But all, you know, st there's still kind of small operations that haven't been heavily scaled yet. They could be uh, in the not too distant future. So we're, we're finally at, at launch pad with some of these companies, but it, it's still not where we thought it was. Now could be a time for somebody to want to buy into some of these assets if any of them were available. And that's something I kind of watch for, just because you are starting to see some proof points that these, you know, that that autonomy can can become a business. If you look at it like look at it like M and A in the pharmaceutical sector, whenever you see a biotech company bought for one or two billion dollars, that's because their drug is getting pretty close to approval, and 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 the big pharma companies who buy them don't see it as as big a risk. And I think with some of the autonomy companies, they're getting to the point where it, okay, their technology works and there might be a business here and somebody with some money might want to buy it or invest in it to try to get it to the next level and scale it up. I, I think we're getting closer to that point. I don't know exactly when it is, but I think you're starting to to see some of that. I mean, it's still not, it's still difficult to see it as an investment when you don't have federal regulations yet. And, and I know a lot of investors are on the sideline for that reason. But at least the technology is working pretty well, and you're starting to see some of these these test fleets out there bringing some real money from paying customers. They're bringing in real money, the test fleet. They're also generating money from the fence. The fence is hot now. And Dreesen Horowitz, Mark's out there, Ben's out there talking about American Dynamism and the, and the investment that's going into DOD. Kodiak has a very large Department of Defense business. Fraterra has a very large Department of Defense business. Does DOD become the old, new venture capitalists to accelerate the the adoption of autonomy and the development of it? Yeah, look, it, it's, I mean, the, the military, of all the things we've talked about, I mean, I, I put it on a scale here of where is autonomy most useful? And the military is absolutely number one, right? Drones, which are already out there, I mean, they're being used left, right, and center in Russia, you know, by Russia and against Russia and Ukraine, being used in Gaza. So that that's an easy one. U.S. military does use robots, but you know, for bomb detection. But there are a lot of uses that I don't know about that they're probably already doing, and many more that they're working on. And and look, that could help a lot of these companies get funding to continue to work on commercial and consumer type of applications. So yeah, it's like 
military is a great place for this stuff too. Plus they have a big budget. And you know, one thing I do know about the military is, is I had a close friend who used to work for, uh, as a civilian engineer for the army. They have all kinds of programs they spend a lot of money on, and some of them never see the light of day, but they they they, they do some pretty active R and D. And, you know, being able to accomplish missions while keeping troops out of harm's way is is huge for them. After that, look, it's trucking, right? Because there's a real need there. And and I do think the the it's easier to do, you know. Hi- highway trips between distribution centers and 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 hub and spoke kind of systems. Um Really good application. Robotaxi is the toughest because it requires the most data. You know, e- even if you're safer, even if you have very few accidents uh, and, and and no fatalities like Cruise did, there's still a lot of scrutiny when something happens. Does Uber become the biggest winner for the robotaxi because they act as a Visa and a MasterCard for autonomy? They get a transact. They get a cut of that transaction for each ride without having to take the legal liability, without having to build the infrastructure, without having to spend the billions of, of dollars. Is that does that who they become? I'm not sure how they avoid the liability because they would they'd be the operator of the vehicle, even if it's somebody else's car. It's sort of like if you and I get in an accident because of you know, a, a, a lawyer would sue us and the company just because they kind of blanket it first and see who can escape the, the litigation. But look, Uber Uber could be a big winner here if somebody can make this work because they've been trying to get rid of the driver costs for a long time. It's very interesting to say because our RBC Capital Markets put out a report that's available in the terminal where RBC Capital Markets – has been feeling a massive increase in calls about the impact on Uber's business, leading to investors increasingly shorting Uber. Uber currently has a 2.61% short interest. Is this investors, in your opinion, trying to get ahead of a potential trend, or is this simply investors not having a deep understanding of how the market works for autonomy? Good question. I, I, I don't know. Is it a sign that there's still no faith in autonomy delivering anytime soon? Would you know? Would would the, the public companies that are out there in autonomy, are they worth shorting? Because all the stocks are really depressed as it is. There are many of them. But if, if you really believed in autonomy and you had a long-term investment horizon, you'd see more people going long in it right now. I mean, you know, you look at, I mean, I always kind of use Aurora as the benchmark, you know, where they, I haven't looked at it in the past couple of days, but, you know, where are they trading right now? I mean, that's been a depressed stock for quite a while. You know, they're still trading at 276, down 10% this year almost. You know, it's just sort of been lingering down there waiting for proof points. And, I, you know, they're because they've switched to trucking, although they do have some robotaxi technology too, you know, they're probably the best proxy for market sentiment on autonomous vehicles. Okay, let's stay on the, on the Aurora truck for a minute. Aurora is very public, and they did an investor day that they're going to go drive route in Q4. Commercial, not not testing. Not doing what Too Simple did, the Ghost Rider, one night, two night, running multiple revenue generating runs. Does that start to move the, the investor sentiment if those runs are successful over the course of a quarter, two quarters, three quarters, that this technology is real and it's working? Yeah, I think it would. I mean, that, that's kind of what they've predicated their their business plan on is, is getting that technology working, test driver free. Their plan, I think, is... You know, prove that out, and that'll help them raise more money. And then if they get enough, then they can start to scale it up. So, yeah, I, I think, I mean, does it make the stock skyrocket? Tough to say, just because it's such a depressed segment. But it certainly will have investors watching, put it that way. Whether or not they buy, yeah, who knows? You know, investors are pretty fickle, and there are a lot of good technology plays going on. I think the money... Those who want to try to bet and bet big will go into other kinds of AI that'll have a more near-term approach. And and really, what you know, what have we seen right now? It's been the picks and shovel side of AI that's like Nvidia uh, that's that's been drawing a lot of the money. There's still a wait and see, but I, I look that that will get people looking. It'll get people watching it at a minimum. Okay, it'll get people watching. And you, and you look at the picks and shovel side of AI. I'm fascinated with, with what Andy Jassy is doing at Amazon. The Anthropic investment was brilliant. They put it into the Amazon AWS bedrock system. 
obviously they have Zooks and we don't know what's going on at Zooks. I've heard that they tried to put it on trucks and it didn't work. I've also heard the system is highly dependent on Hisai LIDARs. And if there was a Hisai ban, the Zooks vehicle wouldn't work. But that aside, could we see Amazon get really clever and do a prime mobility tier to start to generate some of this revenue? So Vegas is a city, perhaps San Francisco is another city, just do it strategic cities to try and generate some of this revenue, not do a, a pay per ride, but a monthly subscription service. Hmm. I mean, like roll out their own like new division, incorporating their their different autonomy bets and trying to make make some some money off of this. Jeez, it's a good idea. I just don't know if that's where their head is. You know, they've been very secretive about this whole thing. I mean, you and I have been trying to figure out where they are for a long time. I'd have to say pass on that one. I, just, <laughs> I don't know what they're going to do. To me, Amazon, if you look at Andy Jassy's out there very publicly, cut cost. He said that in his annual shareholder letter. Increase, increase warehouse efficiency, increase automation. To me, the big play for Amazon is trucking, auto- autonomous trucking. They, they have the, the program there. Do they is, just kind of leave Zooks to make it Bezos' little pet project and then really just double and triple down on autonomous trucking? Because that fits into their core business operations? You know, what I've wondered is, does, I mean, I, I see a lot of people delivering Amazon packages that aren't in the big vans, right? It's individuals. Mm-hmm. Do you replace them for your small targeted deliveries with a fleet of robotaxi type of cars that Zooks would do? Does that make sense? It, it That could. Now, the, the problem with package delivery autonomously has always been, you know, people aren't necessarily home. So how do you drop the package off, get it to the front door? So do you have some sort of Zook style vehicle where you're not paying someone who's a driver, you just have a sorter type of person in there and the vehicle knows where to go. The vehicle does all the scheduling and could that somehow increase their throughput? That's a possibility. I mean, it's always to me been kind of a head scratcher that Amazon bought Zooks because Zooks wasn't a trucking autonomous company. And I, I, it, you know, Amazon does a lot of things, right? You know, they've got, content they've i mean in addition to the all the goods they sell they've got content they've got amazon web services there's a lot of things that they do i've, I've wondered if zooks wouldn't be like some something like amazon web services where it becomes an autonomous operating system for car companies who don't want to develop this which is basically all of them except for general motors and toyota right because toyota's got the investment in main mobility everybody else to the degree that they're interested in autonomy needs or would want that. So does, is that what, is that their play with, with Zooks? I can see that. I mean, look, we thought forever, or some people did, it was highly debated. Was Apple going to come up with a car and they, yes, they were developing a car. And yes, they hired people who understand suspensions and chassis and driving dynamics and that sort of thing. As it turns out, if you look at CarPlay 2, CarPlay 2 actually gets into the vehicle. It's not just a projection system for infotainment. That's probably what they were doing all along. So they, they, they maybe built a vehicle, and they might have had an idea of building their own vehicle at one point, but what they probably were really doing is developing vehicles and an autonomous system, by the way, because they were testing those. If you look at the disengagement reports, the vehicle was just literally a test vehicle for them to try out autonomy, to try out how they could have a more integrated software-based vehicle system that they could sell uh, in the same way that Google is, is working with GM on their software-based system and, and, and so on and so forth. A lot of this is, is being a supplier for the software and brains of a vehicle behind the scenes. And if you're Apple, you have to do that by owning a vehicle or building your own vehicle and, and, and developing the software for it. And then you would sell that as an operating system that's more than just a car play sort of play. Does Amazon do that? Hmm, I can see that. If Amazon licensed Zooks, they can bundle with AWS. That gets really interesting. So you get a whole complete package there. I just don't know if licensing fits in Amazon's core business. It always seems that they're historically an operations business. I just, I'm not sure if I see licensing. I do see licensing as being a huge, huge business. When I look at licensing, I think a lot about, I, I believe at some point Tesla will crack F- FSD. They're going to figure out self-driving. I do too. At some point, they probably will. They will license it. Our friend Alan Olsman disagrees with this because he, you know, this came up at uh, Arts 23 
And it was the final question. And, and Alan said, Elon talked about full self-driving in 2016. He's full of it. I'm paraphrasing. Sorry, Alan. And, and I said, look, you're right. But he also has Elon slash Tesla. They have the ability to lure and pay some of the smartest people out there for this sort of thing. And I, I do think Tesla's serious about it. But yeah, they, they, they've been in hot water with regulators over autopilot. So they've got to get this right. And Elon does miss targets all the time. But they're, I, I think they're totally serious about this. And I think they've probably got some very good capabilities too. So you just, when it comes to transportation technology, you just can't count Tesla out, no matter how annoyed you may be with Elon Musk and, and impatient with, with his previous announcements. When they crack FSD, they license it. Does that become their biggest business inside of Tesla, licensing? Certainly could, right? I mean, in the same way that it could for, for Waymo and that it could for Cruise if they ever get their act together, and it could be for Amazon, could be for May Mobility for that matter. Any of these companies could could do that. I mean, th- think about Grace and think about all the trucking companies you and I talk about all the time. You know, they don't want to build trucks. They want to sell their system to truck partners. And that's, is that a licensing agreement? I mean, there are different ways you can legally set it up. And that, that gets beyond my knowledge of this stuff. But that's what they're going to do. And there's no re- I mean, you know, GM had licensed Domstar years ago to Lexus and might have been Mercedes. And they had a couple of partners. It never really lasted. They, 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 they didn't do a good job of spreading that around. But that is a model where even if you're a car company, you develop this system that works pretty well and you license it to competitors, they might have to spin it out to do that. The other companies we're talking about don't have that problem because they're not car companies. May Mobility may be funded by Toyota, but you know there's nothing that says they couldn't send their system out to somebody else. And, and same thing with Amazon and you know, slash Zooks. Same, and, and, and I think that's, that is Waymo's business besides running their own robo-taxi business. I'll give you a prediction on May Mobility. They're going to be acquired by, by a Japanese conglomerate. I'm not saying Toyota, but I believe they're going to be acquired by a, a Japanese corporation conglomerate. And they'll become a Japanese company based on the new rule that went into effect April 1st around the overtime, the massive driver shortage in Japan, the age and population, and they have the ability to write a relationship to go into that market. May Mobility becomes the largest self-driving car company in Japan when they get acquired. That's what I think what happens to May. That's a pretty fearless forecast, but look, I, there's a lot of logic there. I, I would think Toyota would be the one to do it. And you, know, you end up with a model sort of like when GM bought Cruise in the first place where they provide the vehicles and a lot of the integration engineering. And you know, Toyota's got massive market share in Japan. So what what easier way to kind of control that business as a leader in Japan because you're getting instant volume? I, I don't think Toyota would let somebody else take it out from under them. And it wouldn't cost them much. Toyota's got a lot of cash. It wouldn't cost them much to buy this, I don't think. No. I don't think it would cost much to buy. I don't think it would cost much to move it. I think that the tech is fit for that market the way that May's rolled out. You covered this early on when they ran the Detroit Circulator. They've done a lot of really interesting things. I think their model fits for where the Japanese government wants to go with autonomy. Let's get back to Tesla. So Tesla cracks self-driving. Does that cause a complete reboot of the autonomous driving stack where Tesla's able to do it with with, with a camera-based per, uh, perception system? Does Waymo force to develop a it's called a Waymo light system? And does that open the door for Wave, the UK startup, to gain significant market share since they're using an embodied AI approach very similar to what Tesla's doing? Does that become the new approach? Well, back up and doesn't, I mean, Tesla does use LiDAR, though. No, no LiDAR. They don't have any. I thought they, I thought they had incorporated some into their vehicles. I, I, I don't know that the technology you use to be the many eyes of the vehicle matters i think whatever system works is you know what everyone's going to have to use and when we see we'll see in august maybe tesla incorporates lidar into a system that's supposed to be full robo taxi they haven't said anything about that but I, I i think it's possible or a 4d radar would be interesting if they incorporate a 4d radar which has some similar capabilities as a LIDAR, the stack's going to be the big question. Nobody's talking about that. What's the stack going to look like? Is it going to be the same thing you buy on a Model 3 or Model Y today? Or did Tesla build up a spoke stack just for the robo-taxi? 
That's the big question that should be asked. Yeah, I think they'd have to build a bespoke stack for the robo taxi because the 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 mapping requirements and data requirements are a lot bigger, aren't they? They are. If and you're going to robo taxi, and then don't forget, you have to have a steering wheel and pedals. With, with, otherwise, you need a NHTSA exemption. You think Elon's going to get a NHTSA exemption in this political environment? If his if the car works, I think he would. But Cruz was working on theirs until everything blew up on them. So I, I, I think NHTSA is going to eye that stuff very cautiously, given the environment that uh, autonomy is certainly under right now. You, you, let's get on Cruz. You broke the story with Cruz testing in Phoenix. They made some key hires. They hired Steve Kenner, chief safety officer. They hired a good friend of mine, Rob Grant, as he's now the chief government affairs officer. You're hiring Mr. Kenner. You're hiring Mr. Grant. All signs they point. Billy Martin with Rob Grant. Yes, they did. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a, a fun thing about Rob, and Rob, I'm going to say, Rob, his childhood dream, and you'll appreciate this, David, was to play the outfield for the New York Yankees. That was Rob's childhood dream. That's great. I didn't even know he was a Yankees fan. He is. I, I, I said to him on his first run through before he you know, pulled the Billy Martin maneuver, Rob, the greatest thing ever, and you would have to join us, David, we're in New York. We get picked up in Midtown at the Bloomberg Building on Lex, and we go to a Yankees game in a crew self-driving car. Now, that would be something else. That would. Uh, although, look, I think it'll be a long time before we see robo-taxis in New York because, first off, it's obviously really difficult to drive in Manhattan. But remember, you know, Cruz wanted to test AVs years ago in New York. And the city or the state are both mandated that you had to have a state trooper following the vehicle and pay the officer overtime to do it. And it was so onerous, Cruz scrapped the plan. So I, I think in New York, you're looking at you know, a similar, maybe even more rigorous regulatory environment than you see in, in San Francisco. And you know, that's tough. And you know, look, one thing we haven't mentioned is what if Waymo in California has to have safety drivers now because of the legislation going on there. You've got more detail on that than I do, but the regular regulatory environment in, in these really congested cities where we actually need robotaxis more and where they make a lot of sense is getting tougher. It looks like the, the driver in Bill's dead. doesn't look like that it's going to get through. The one that Waymo's fighting very hard that will destroy their business overnight is the local control bill. Local control bill continues to move along. It's not great, but it continues to, to move along. doesn't say momentum it did which will essentially would allow each city municipality to set their, their own rules. If that became law, Waymo's out of business in California. It's over. Every, every AV company's done in California. It's an effective ban. Why is it a ban, though, if every municipality can set their own rules? Because some, I mean, San Francisco would probably be tough on robo-taxis, but others, other towns, especially smaller towns with wider streets, might let them in. Let's use the L.A. example. Uh, yeah. Let's say, oh, we're, we're going to stay on sports here. Let's, we're, we're downtown wa- watching a Lakers game. It's an afternoon game, and then we, we want to go to the beach to take a swim and and have some dinner. So you, you have to go through L.A., you go through West Hollywood, you go through Beverly Hills, you go through Santa Monica, and you end up in Malibu. That's five separate municipalities and five different sets of laws. So what's the next thing? They're going to put their own DMV to enforce those rules? It gets, it gets tricky. It gets absolutely tricky. Yeah, it does, actually. Waymo could still do trips in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, getting people from homes or business and parking to sports arenas and that sort of thing. But yeah, you're right. You couldn't you couldn't take your robo taxi from the Lakers game to Melville Beach. It puts a lot of restrictions on their businesses. I, I, there's just such a significant voice in California that doesn't like robo taxi mm-hmm. that. Uh, I don't know if it destroys everybody's business, but it, yeah, it really it reduces the appeal to do business there. I mean, the cost to deal with the regulatory scheme in San Francisco and in California has got to be pretty high. The amount of staff you have, the amount of work you need to do. It's astronomical. And it, it, it's a tough place to drive, so I'm not saying they shouldn't necessarily do that. And. Waymo started out in Chandler, Arizona, this suburb of Phoenix. I've been actually in Chandler. I lived there for a week when I was playing in the Old Man's World Series. It's an easy place to drive. You're talking five, six-lane roads and, you know, 
protected turns going into shopping malls and strip malls and this sort of thing. I mean, it, it's that's very that's very good basic driving for a robo taxi. Way more learn there. Am I? Cruise should have started in an environment similar than not in San Francisco, the hostile environment. We'd be having a different conversation today about Cruise. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think, I think Cruise would say that too. That they, you know, they kept saying, you know, if, if they, they kept referring to this as a moonshot, and I think it was a moonshot because they picked one of the most difficult cities to drive in and gather map data on. I mean, you're talking five point intersections and things like that big hills and congestion and, and pedestrians everywhere. Really tough. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, look where, where Oliver Cameron, who ended up at Cruise, he started with Voyage. You know, they were in retirement uh, centers. Very easy driving. And, and really, if you think about what Gaddick does for Walmart, really easy driving. And, and you, you build and the machine learns and you get better and, and you can make some revenue in the meantime. Yeah, it, and it, so where you know where's GM restarting Phoenix, and they were looking at Houston, which is you know another western city, southwestern city with hospitable weather, and you know wide. You know I used to live in Texas, very wide open streets, newly paved streets, better signals. Northeastern cities, the infrastructure is older, and roads are narrower, things are tougher to read, just easier to drive in those areas. So, the cruise is costing GM a lot of money. It's impacting their operating income by three point five billion in twenty twenty three, three point two billion in twenty twenty two, and one point three billion in twenty twenty one. How's GM going to rein in the costs? Well, they already have. We'll see. So they, they announced earnings this coming Tuesday, and I'll, I'll be keenly watching how much they spend on cruise in the first quarter because you know, they they laid off a quarter of the workforce. They've they down their tools in they were gathering data, which means they had people in cars on the ground in 20 markets. Now they're doing it in one. They were operating in three with a large fleet in San Francisco. All of that is shut down. So you take away all that headcount, you take away all those operations in those other cities, vehicles running, charging, real estate, all those expenses thrown in, licensing, you name it. And I mean, is it half? I don't know, but it's it's going to be a lot less, and we'll see. Uh, but it, it's like I think we've already seen how they're going to rein in costs. I don't know that they do any more than that because you know now that they've started testing in a market, maybe they'll add one or two others if things go well. You know that that tells you that they probably bottomed out in terms of the the whole grounding and freeze of the business, and now they're starting to slowly work their way back up the curve. Well, they're starting to slowly work their way up the curve, and then CFRA is out there in a recent research report saying there's an alphabet moonshot that's going to contribute materially to the bottom line by 2027. They're predicting that that to be Waymo. That's three years from now. Let's say Waymo goes public, alphabet goes public with the Waymo numbers. They're they're significant. Mm -hmm. Does that put pressure on GM to once again ramp up operations? Are they just going to take this slow and steady? They're not going to move as fast as they did last time, no matter what the market's doing. Look, there's going to be pressure on GM, but I, I really think this was, you know, they, they were burned so hard by this that they are absolutely going to go very slowly with it. And look, this is, you know, my book on Mary Barr, it's called Charging Ahead for a Reason. She's been, a, if you look at her technology bets, Mary Barr has been a very, very aggressive CEO. They have, they're not selling a lot of EVs right now because they stopped building the Bolt, and they're going to come out with a new one next year. But look at starting with the Hummer and the Cadillac Lyric. Now you've got a Blazer Equinox, mm -hmm. Chevy Silverado EV. You actually have two different Hummers. You have a, a GMC coming later this year. You have the two bright drop electric fans out there. That's like eight or nine EVs they're launching in two years. That's a very aggressive launch schedule. They were very aggressive with crews. They are replacing CarPlay with their own Ultify system. Again, an aggressive move. And in all three of those areas, they've had technological difficulties getting this stuff to work and getting it out the door. They're fixing some of that stuff, but but it's a really aggressive company when it comes to trying to get this stuff out there and, and, and take a leadership position. And I mean, you got to give them an A for effort, and then you know maybe a uh, and you know a, a D minus for execution. And and they're they're you know they're working to fix these things. They they just you know between the the battery fires with the bolt and the meltdown at Cruise 
And now, you know, they're, they're slowly working their way out of production issues they've had with the Ultium battery pack. To, you know, they're, they're finally getting some decent volume, still not great volume of production with those batteries. I, I think they, they can't afford another problem. So even though they may feel pressure to want to go into more cities and speed up testing and, and start to monetize and, and show their shareholders that there's a reason they're paying whatever they're going to be paying every quarter for it, the, 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 the downside risk to going too fast is way too big for this company. And it's, it's one of the single biggest problems that GM has is when they announced they were replacing CarPlay, everybody was skeptical that their own system would be any good because their technology bets have not always gone so well. And they have to overcome that. And you don't do that by rushing back to market with autonomy and having another problem. It's just, I, I think that's the reality they face. They do. Why has GM been so bad at executing these new technological advancements? Look, I, I think they tried to move really fast and, and it hurt them. You know, they, and look, all of the legacy car companies have had serious problems launching electric vehicles. Porsche, VW have had software problems, pretty serious software problems, I think. Toyota had wheels falling off the BZ4X, which is crazy. Literally, wheels, wheels falling off of it because they used the same bolts that they used for the wheels on their internal combustion vehicles, but there was extra weight and torque, and they got loose. Which, and they, look, Toyota's a great manufacturer. When they're having problems, you know this is a tough assignment. GM's problems, I've written a ton about. You and I have talked a lot about them. But everyone's having difficulty. They're all they're going they're all going through the problems that Tesla went through five ten years ago, and so I I think that's you know GM and the other car companies they thought we make cars this is just a different powertrain so it'll be fine. Well, it wasn't. Why are they having trouble with that that software system in the Chevy Blazer? They're not a software company. They've hired they've they've added a lot of people from Silicon Valley and they've hired a lot of code writers, and they're they're building that organization, but. Software is tough, you know. It's and if you have software problems in a vehicle, it's just it's not something that can happen. If your if your iPhone crashes on you, you now you reboot it and okay, you go on about your day. It's annoying, and it can happen at very opportune times. I I once missed a really good fantasy trade because my iPhone crapped out on me, and, and you know, but that's not that's not a safety issue, right? And it's not the vehicle you drive every day. So, I, I think in a lot of these cases, and Cruz very well documented that they move too fast with it. I think they just, they wanted to catch up to Waymo. They wanted to catch up to Tesla. They wanted to try to get out from under the yoke of Apple CarPlay in their car, and they tried to do all these things. And and it's just, you know, there are times when speed kills. And, you know, I, I think in all three cases it did. Move fast and break things doesn't work in the automotive business. Point, Honestly, point. I don't know that it works that great in the technology uh, business either. It's just easier to get away with because it's easier to iterate and easier to update than it is to fix vehicles. And it's less embarrassing and you know people don't get injured when a phone crashes or a software or a video game package has bugs in it uh, on, on version 1.0. In your opinion, what should we watch for in the autonomous vehicle and truck industries as these companies begin to commercialize? On, on the truck side, we're going to see a lot of launches this year. So I, I, I think the second half of this year is going to be really big to see how well this technology works. Because if it does work well, with you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of stuff from, you talked about Aurora earlier, we know Gattic is doing some stuff uh, later this year and, and continues to do, and, and they're doing some things right now. If this technology continues to work well, we could see autonomous trucking maybe shipped into second gear in 2025. Robo taxi, Waymo is still the one to watch. So if if they can start to accelerate their their scaling and their deployment, that tells you that technology is getting closer to ready for prime time. And and by prime time, I mean like really pushing bigger fleets, more cities quickly. I mean, look, we got to watch crews too, just because. You know, when when do they go from? Well, I mean, right now what they're doing is testing with a driver, but really they're just regathering mapping data and refreshing what they've already gathered in Phoenix, and then probably do it in some other cities. Eventually, what do they? You know, at what point do they start actually providing service, even if there's a test driver in the vehicle? 
And that's what they that's that's how they've mapped this out. They said once they're satisfied that they've remapped it accurately, then they'll start pushing it into pushing the next level, which is just ferrying people around with a test driver in the car. It's going to be a long time for that. I mean, you know, if if that next phase uh, of carrying people around still as a test driver in it, they're, they're a long ways from where they were seven months ago when you could go to San Francisco and get a ride with no driver. Cruz has a long road ahead of them. They're making the right decisions. They're making the right hires, and, and we'll see how far along they get on that road. David, for today, as we look to wrap up, what would you like our listeners and viewers to take away with them? Look, it, 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 as far as autonomy, I to keep an eye on the things that you and I just talked about. Look, I, this year is huge for electric vehicles, too. Tesla's sales were not only down sequentially, they were down year over year, which is big. In the U.S., that is. So where are, where are uh, U.S. consumers with electric vehicles? And you know, there is a big pause, but you're also seeing some important vehicles come to market right now that are lower priced. And I and I, I think we need to keep an eye on that to see how ready the the American consumer is to try out new technology and go with an EV. So I'd, I'd keep an eye on that as well. Watch the autonomy markets. Watch the EV markets. We're going into second gear in autonomy EV market. We're going to see how consumers adapt. The future is bright. The future is autonomous. The future is commercialization. David, thank you so much for coming on the road to autonomy, autonomy economy today. Always a pleasure. If you've enjoyed listening, please kindly rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Road to Autonomy. Or email podcast at roadtoautonomy.com. The Road to Autonomy podcast is produced by the Road to Autonomy LLC. The views and opinions expressed on the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect those views of the Road to Autonomy, its subsidiaries, its shareholders, directors, investors, or partners. The content discussed on this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, investment, tax, or business advice. Nothing is a recommendation that you purchase, sell, or hold any security or other investment or that you pursue any investment style or strategy. The content of this podcast is presented on an as-is basis with no warranties, express, or implied of any kind. Financial mentions about companies in the Road to Autonomy Index and discussions about the Road to Autonomy Indexes are for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon when making any investment decision. Furthermore, an inclusion of security within the Road to Autonomy Index is not a recommendation by the Road to Autonomy Indices, LLC, to buy, sell, or hold that such security, nor is it considered to be investment advice.